It's the largest sap I've ever seen in the flesh, that's for sure. Oh, wow. Is this still functional? If yes, yes. Drive? This factory that Russell had was considered the very first metalworking factory in the United States. What's up guys, Ian Sandusky from Lakewood Machine and Tool back here again for Practical Machinists. And today we have a very special shop tour for you. We're here in Greenfield, Massachusetts at the Museum of Our Industrial Heritage. We're gonna go in there, check out some of the oldest machinery I've ever seen, some really vintage stuff, and hopefully we're gonna learn a little bit about this hotbed of American manufacturing history. Let's go check it out. So here to give us a little background on this fantastic place is my friend Al. Al, thank you very much for joining okay. us today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this building here? The building uh, has always been machine shops, at least from 1860, okay? And the wood building is from 1840s, and it was originally across the street. So they actually brought this over here at yeah, one point. Yeah, there was a fire that built, burned the original building, and they moved this building to replace it. The log brick building, uh, is from 1870 and you notice a sign that says Greenfield Steel Stamp Works. That was the last industrial tenant around 1980, 1990 and it made metal stamps. Around 1920 there was a tenant that made cutlery, predominantly butchering tools. Now you were saying that when it comes to New England most places around here tended to be textiles but this has actually always been metalworking. Always been metalworking. Uh, the valley in the valley from, I would say, new, from New Haven, Connecticut, up to Springfield, Vermont. is very high in uh, metalwork industries. Uh, it started from the firearms industry in Springfield, and those skills spread up the valley. So joining me now is Jim, who is the president of the Museum of Our Industrial Heritage. Jim, thank you very much for joining us today. Hey, welcome you guys, great to have you here. So we're here in Greenfield, Massachusetts. We're in the heart of the, uh, well, the cradle of metalworking in the United States. This is the Museum of Our Industrial Heritage. So in the building here, this the building, as Al mentioned, from 1870s, um, put together for early pioneers of the tap and dye industry. And the last industry was the steel stamp in the 1990s and since then it it grew into an incubator um, like a creative space so when we bought the place there was a couple few tenants in here and the price was right and the, there was enough income to move the museum in here and we're so glad we did because this is one of the most important sites in in industrial history american history and in uh, Western Massachusetts. So what I've seen here just from stepping inside is I see an absolute ton of specimens that look like they are original <laughs> and some of them look very, very old. Yeah, very, these, everything in here, very authentic. Um, some of the earliest devices, blacksmith tools, we're talking mid 1800s, late 1800s. The descendants of the original tap and die companies are still here. You know, we don't have thousands of people working, but um, they're surviving and they have a lot of customers and people still know this area for um, certain technologies, notably thread technology, which is the big industry here. The very first, what we call the very first metalworking industry that we can point to here was cutlery, which um, seems kind of basic, like, you know, everybody has it, but really, when we were a colony, we were forbidden to have any type of metalworking. Really? Absolutely. I had no idea. This was high tech at the time. Right. Making really good quality steel and blades. So, um, right after Revolutionary War, um, certain people decided that we Americans needed our own industries. And so, but we basically didn't have metalworking. When I say industry, I mean a coordinated, um, organized system. That right. really didn't even exist, not even in Europe that much. 
things were still do, done kind of, you know, cottage industry type of thing. And this is where some of that standardization industry started to come in. When I say cutlery, it started out with simple things like chisels. Wow. And this was a paint scraper. And what year would that be from? That's mid 1800s. 1800s. Yes. Okay. And also the methods now. Mm -hmm. We're not making onesies and hammering them out in a blacksmith shop. The ideas that are coming out now from like the Springfield Armory and the concepts of interchangeable parts and standardization is taking root in, in the Springfield Armory. The government had set up the armory to build arms, which we didn't have before the Revolutionary War. So that kind of set the pace for how companies operated here. This is where you started seeing, of course, high quality materials and um, processes like stamping with tools and dyes. This is 1834, mm -hmm. mind you, okay? And what really put these guys on the map in the 1840s, this was known as the Green River Knife. Green River Knife. Right, made at the Green River Works here on the Green River. And this was the indispensable tool that the frontiersmen needed. And when you read the histories of out west, um, this is the blade everybody had to have. In the decade 1840s and 50s, 720,000 of these were made here. In the, wow, right here. His original factory was right where we are now. They moved just a quarter mile down the river. Um, 720,000 of these sent down the Connecticut River in barrels packed in grease <laughs> all the way out to the Mississippi River, up the Mississippi River, and then put on steamboats going out west. And this put them on the map. And the term Green River became synonymous with well-made, well high-quality tools. And things are just starting to expand out here. You got all this water power. You got the highway coming up. Things just took root here. Um, by the 1860s, something that common people wouldn't even had before this period is common tableware, okay? was That was kind of an expensive um, household item that mostly wealthy people would have afforded. They started making, this is 1860 to 1920, they started making this high quality uh, common people's tableware, they were making 38,000 a day of wow. these in a water-powered factory. It doesn't take much, but once you get tooled up for it. So that's, you know, that's how Greenfield, and it's considered that this factory that Russell had was considered the very first metalworking factory in the United States. Wow. So this, this is different than they're doing in Europe. And the Europeans were, and especially England, had the, the, the world market on cutlery. And the last thing they wanted was competition from us. They started undercutting, dumping their product here. They tried everything to put them out of business. But by the 1860s, they had essentially pushed uh, Britain out of the market in the United States. And from then on, it was, it was all American-made cutlery. The next step in the evolution here was when the cutlery moved out their building, that was 18, late 1860, 1868. Now we've just come through the Civil War, okay? And before the Civil War, this is called a jam plate. This is something that a blacksmith would have used to put on a crude thread. It's basically the first kind of thread die. Right, it was called a jam plate. And it really didn't cut material, it formed it. And this would have been handmade by the individual blacksmith. And um, the, the counterpart would have been taps, which they would have made. And of course, these look nothing like a modern tap because no. they do not cut, they form. And the trick with the blacksmith was he had the knowledge to, as tempering and whatnot to make these harder. And that's what gave it the ability to even form a Begin or display. Begin to thread. <laughs> right. But you can imagine what it would take to make even a simple nut and bolt. Until the mid-1800s... Couldn't imagine. A simple nut and bolt has not even been achieved that's repeatable. So by this time, Greenfield gets to be known as a place where if you have a product to develop, it's a good place to come. So 1871, 
a machinist named John Grant comes to Greenfield with a new patent for a thread cutting device that we now to know today is a modern thread cutting die. What year is this one from? This is 1871. This is 1871. Right. That looks almost identical to the kind of thread die you well, find today. This is before electricity and water power. And they're still coming up with this. They're coming up with this. So we should all be in awe of these early guys. I am, I'm a tool maker <laughs> myself and I marvel at in this building this took place, you know, so it's, it's quite quite amazing story. So that just it explodes from there. And this is typical of all kinds of uh, new companies and technology. In 1912, when all these companies come back together, they're brought back together with, you know, typical corporation financing from <laughs> Wall Street and all that, right? Changed everything. But in 1912, Greenfield was the wealthiest place in the world. Wow. By per capita income, because all these jobs were super high skilled jobs. They were highest paid wages in the world, right here in this, that's, in this I area. I never would have thought that. No, I mean, that's why it's such, a, it's such an interesting story. A lot of people, this stuff's been under the radar for, you know, ever. But I, that's why we really felt this is a story worth telling. It, it created so much wealth here. Um, and it's still, you know, it's still, it has an impact. Absolutely. This is 1870s. This wow. is the first, one of the first products of the Wiley and Russell, that first company they formed. I, you just have to marvel at this. No, before electricity, water powered machine tools, if you could call them that at that time. Another whole industry, we talked about the steel stamp was here. Well, everything in these devices is got, Stamped. all our tools are, have, you know, hey, this is the, now we're, you know, we're American manufacturers, we're independent, we want people to know who made these, you know, where they're made, you need serial numbers, sizes, so the whole stamping industry follows along in the wake of this, and I'd like someone in in the forum, in the in the world out there, to help me understand <laughs> how, they how these this. were mass, <laughs> now these are mass, this is not one-offs, these are no, mass-produced. Mass this fine stamping, People, those were probably handmade stamps to do that. It's insane. Um, then boxes, you know, all these great tools we use, they come in these lovely wooden boxes. There's a real reason for that because they absorb moisture. Um, and so a whole box industry developed here for these products. This is an example of what someone might still come back here to Greenfield to have made. This is a five and three quarter, six, Tap. It's the largest tap I've ever seen in the flesh, that's for sure. That um, is huge. It's solid M1 tool steel. It was made by Vermont Tap and Die Company, wow. which was absorbed into these companies at some point. And what's the application for a okay. tap like this? Well, here's, here's, here's part of their um, Greenfield Tap and Die's um, advertising this capability. And it's showing that this is a Babcock and Wilcox um, nuclear power plant oh, construction. Wow. So precise, giant parts in, you know, big things, you know. Like, I was going to say battleship, yeah. so I guess I wasn't so, far off. Are precisely sized, so they would have... straight. <laughs> right, so the company would have sold a package, like a custom right. package, maybe one or two. The They would sell them the reamers because they have to ream the hole to have it Correct. really precise. And probably, you know, some type of uh, quality control measuring thread gauges. So those are the other tools that come right along. They made the gauges and um, became the standards for gauges. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this is a shaper, but I've never seen one with a wheel before. What are we looking at here? So what we're seeing here is what, before we had rotary cutting tools, like milling machine cutters and things like that, the planer was the essential machine for creating flat surfaces. Or I've seen these powered by hydraulics or by big right. flywheels. I've never seen right. one of these powered by hand before. Right. And that is actually cutting right now, for those oh, yeah. who may not be able to see. That's taking, right. that's throwing a chip every right. single time. And 
the basics of a shaper is you have an automatic, this one has a ratchet in Paul that feeds the, the head assembly over during each stroke. So this actually looks like a hand operated machine, but my assumption is, is that this was powered by overhead belt. There's still no other machine that can create a flat surface over the distance like a shaper. Right. Because it's a single point and it's as accurate as the waves go. Um, it also has an articulating head with the tool, like a protractor, so we can actually feed down and cut angles. Right, what, make a nice angle. The finish. early guys would do slotting on these. It's amazing. Very versatile given what it is. Right, and it again, time consuming, probably, you know, you had, you know, there's, I've seen pictures of, you know, rows of these, you know, 10 or 20, even 30 of them. All running at the same time. All running and, and you know, one guy told me they used to pull a trick. They were on the top floor of a brick building and they used to get all the big, they had all big, they used to get them all going the same and try to rock the building. You the actual building yeah. go. <laughs> so you see some of them big ones. I mean, the momentum on them things is incredible. It's ridiculous. So what do we have here? So believe it or not, this is a photo enlarger. And it was made by a company called the American Photographic Appliance Company. And it's like 1920 vintage. A number of things are coming together at this time. Optical technology, electricity is coming in. As you could see, there's a lot of machine and fabricating in something like this. Absolutely. It's, it's 140 pounds. Wow. Had it in the back of my Impala and uh, it got it here but basically it was a auto semi-automated photo printer that would operate on a foot on a one pedal. action would operate everything the, the key here is is that the idea was automate almost like automating the idea was how do I make something that's mass production right and that's what we did and we have the 1950 version in the cabinet over there that's like this big and that's what have been back in the day when you had film right. to develop, you brought it to wherever, they would have had these people made those enlargers. And um, so it's just an example of other, you know, non machine tool type of companies that were here. And there was many companies that had a lot of different kind of products. Most of them needed castings. Yep. These are casted, you know, lots of casting. So. Um, this was the place to come when you want to develop a product. Behind me, these, if I'm reading that correctly, those are something to do with artillery shells. Absolutely. One of the most top secret projects in World War II was the proximity fuse, which was literally a radar that was put in the nose cone of an artillery shell, and you could set a distance, okay, variable timing means you can set a distance from an object and it would detonate was it changed World War Two complete game changer. a complete change here when you think if you study what it took to try and hit you know a buzzing air bomber going by with from a ship with an artillery um, a lot of math even with radar it was very difficult to do maybe 10% kill rate maybe this turned it around to 90% kill rate the most important arguably component was the brain which was tube technology at the time that's actually a triode Raytheon came here during towards the end of World War II and set up a shop in the Lunt Silversmith and these um, these were classified until the 1990s oh wow we didn't find out about this until then so thank you very much for your time it was today, great Jim. I very much great. appreciate it if you want to find out more about everything you yep. guys have going on here where can they go our website's the best place to go, industrialhistory.org. It's really simple, industrialhistory.org. And there's, um, if you go to, you'll find um, on online resources and social history, you, I have a list of all the museums in the Connecticut Valley that you know, relate to this subject and how they interact with each other. 
There's even, we have genealogies of the uh, machine tool companies, things like that. Um, and also, come visit. You know? Come visit, make sure you yeah. stop in. Yeah. Excellent, thanks again. Okay, great. So there you have it, guys. I hope you enjoyed this very special tour and this very important sl slice of American manufacturing history. This is one of the coolest places we've got to check out. I'm so glad that there are places like this that exist to keep this stuff from getting lost, to keep this history alive, and to keep educating the next generation of machinists. Make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on notifications below to make sure you never miss a video. Thank you very much for watching, guys. You take care, and make sure you check this out.